Hi, I'm Rob Pometeer, one of the co-authors of the book, Marketing Strategy Based on First Principles in Data Analytics. Before I get started in this first session, I wanted to spend a minute and talk about first principles and the organizing framework we use in this book. First principles and defined as the foundational concepts or assumptions on which a theory system or method is based, just like Newton's laws of gravitational attraction, first laws of thermodynamics, it tries to break it down into the fundamental units. Our premise in this book is that marketing, most of marketing strategy, revolves around solving four problems. And these four problems or issues are first principles. Go through each one of those. The first one, all customers differ represented by this pie diagram with customers broken into different segments. The idea is that all customers that you deal with are different and all of our marketing strategy has to deal with addressing these different customers' needs. The second principle we deal with is that all customers change. So not only are they different, kind of inherently different, but over time these customers are moving on what desires and needs they have. So a marketing strategy has to deal with that. The third principle even if you do the first two completely correct, you solve them, if you will, and you're making lots of sales and profits, competitors will come after you. Competitors are gonna react. Every strategy you do, competitors are gonna react. So the third principle we have to deal with is recognizing that all competitors are lack. The fourth principle, principle that we have to deal with is after we address these three, when we execute our marketing strategies, we have fixed resources. All resources are limited. So we have to manage these resource trade-offs. So our premise is that most of marketing strategy is around solving these four first principles or these four marketing problems. And so we organize the book and all the frameworks, processes, and analysis tools around solving these four principles. The idea would be you're sitting in a conference room a year or two from now and you have a marketing problem. What you can do is you can write these four principles across the whiteboard and work at how are we addressing each of them. And what we're gonna spend each of, as we work through all these different sessions is how best to solve each of these four principles. So the agenda for today is first I'm gonna do a little overview of marketing strategy. Where did it come from? Define it. Why is it important? Why is it important to spend your company's resources and your time on solving marketing problems? Then I'm gonna give you a little review of each of the four principles. This is just kind of a very short highlight we're gonna have a session, if, there, if you will, there's a chapter on each one of these principles that we're gonna go into much more deeply. But it's helpful, I believe, to have an overall framework and how these fit together, so when you hear the details, you'll understand and, and be better able to remember them. And then lastly, for the last two points, one is I'm gonna integrate the four principles, show how they come together, and then we also, this book works with Mark Strat. Mark Strat is a, is a separate company and you don't have to work with it, but if you want to, this is a simulation software that lets you practice the four principles in solving. Um, so a couple times I'm going to speak to that. If you don't use MarkStrat or use a different simulation, that's fine, but I think there is some value in both talking about it and hearing and learning the concepts and also doing it. And the market simulation actually lets you do them in a kind of a, a competitive environment. So first we're going to go ahead and start with marketing strategy overview. So a brief history. Where did market strategy start? Well, actually, it didn't start with marketing strategy. It started with military strategy. And that's really the roots of all of marketing is from the military strategy. It arose in a context. If we read this quote, the forces available must be employed with such skill that even in the absence of absolute superiority, relative superiority is attained at the decisive point. This is from the 1800s. This was the idea that militaries had to fight and they always didn't have the biggest army or the best weapons. So they had to pick where they were gonna have their battle and then apply their force there. After the military in the 1800s, really starting in maybe even the 60s and 70s mainly, but even a little bit in the 50s, management scholars added two more elements to this military strategy. They added the idea that you don't have to just win this battle, but we wanna win on year in and year out. So we needed to make that differential advantage, or up here we talked about relative superiority, we needed to make that sustainable. We wanted to make money superior sales and profits for many years to come. So they added the idea of sustainability. The second thing is the military is a little different than a business. 
So they brought it into business performance instead of having your country or your military win. So there were two extra elements the management scholars added. Then in the 80s and 90s, marketing added to the definition. And the big addition that marketing made, they made refinements around it, but the big addition was to think of marketing strategy from the customer's perspective. So not just the firm or the industry, but down to the unit of analysis being the customer. Because that's really where the battle occurs, is winning customer by customer. So if we put these five elements together, the military elements, the management elements, and the marketing elements, we come up with five key elements that are critical for marketing strategy. It leads to a differential advantage over competitors. So when you design a marketing strategy, you need some advantage over your competitors and you're gonna use that to win. It needs to be sustainable. It does no good if you come out with a new product, beat your competitors for six months, and then they copy you and, and wipe you away. You need some way to make that differential advantage sustainable. The third, the differential advantage, the sustainable competitive advantage has to lead to performance. We want to link our strategy to performance because that's the objective of most businesses. Fourth, we're going to think about this and we're going to do a lot of analyses and processes where we think about these benefits from the customer's perspective. Not from the CEOs, not from other stakeholders, from the customer. That's where we believe marketing strategy has to begin and end. And finally, this is not just a set of slides or a binder. It has to lead to decisions and actions. Decisions and actions. Things that you do. So we'll put those five elements together to, to come up with a definition of marketing strategy. But first I want to speak a little bit more about customer centric. What does customer centric mean? It means that you're looking at the problem from the customer's perspective. And we feel that ultimately leads to success or failure. And it's interesting, if you look at the shift, if you went back 20, 30 years, management scholars, but also many marketing scholars, thought of marketing strategy just from the firm's perspective. Did the firm make more money? And what we find is that there's a natural progression to a, a smaller and smaller unit of analysis. So let me explain this. We initially started with economists. If you look at economists, economists tried to understand why some firms perform better than others by looking at industry factors. They say, oh, here's a monopolistic industry and that helps us determine how much money the firms are gonna make in that industry. They look at competitive barriers to entry and exit and such. If you will, Michael Porter's framework. But they were only able to explain, let's say 30 or 40% of the variance in a firm's performance. Management scholars said, no, you can't just look at it from the industry. You gotta get down to a smaller unit of analysis and look at it from the firm's perspective. And they added factors like human resources, leadership, culture, and these organizational structure. And they say these factories, these factors, where one firm is different than another firm on their leadership or their structure, also helps explain why they might outperform each other. So while the economists looked at the industry to explain firm performance, management scholars said, no, you gotta look at firm level factors. And they were maybe able to explain another, let's say 30%, of the variance in a firm's performance. Now marketing scholars come and say, no, you have to go lower yet. You can't just look at the firm, you have to look at the individual customers that work for a firm. What kind of pricing strategy? How does your salespeople or your customer service people deal with them? What kind of loyalty programs do you have? How do you change your pricing across your different customers? How do you build a brand in your customers' minds? And we see these extra factors help explain more variance. So we think the marketing level helps explain at the customer level, this marketing perspective or customer centric perspective helps explain more variance. Putting that all together, we come up with a definition of marketing strategy. And we're gonna use this definition through the whole textbook. Marketing strategy consists of decisions and actions focused on building this sustainable differential advantage relative to competitors. That's kind of who we're trying to be. This is how we're gonna beat them. This is what we're gonna do. And we're gonna do this in the minds of customers. We're gonna take this customer perspective. And we're gonna do this to create value for all stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, what do I mean? Obviously the customer's one stakeholder. We wanna have value to the customer. If we don't have value for the customer long-term, they won't stay with us, they'll go to a competitor. We wanna have value for the firm selling the product or service because otherwise they can't stay in business and keep innovating. But we also want to have value, if you will, for society and for the employees 
And in some cases, there's even other stakeholders. So we recognize that there's multiple stakeholders in this definition. So that's what we have as the definition of marketing strategy. A question that often comes up is how is marketing strategy different than corporate strategy? Very often in management departments, they have a corporate strategy. What's the difference between the two? If we look at it, this big circle is corporate strategy. And here's a definition, kind of a standard definition that they often use for corporate strategy. Let's look at it. The overall scope and direction of the firm and the way in which its various business operations work together to achieve particular goals. You can see they're not getting down to the customer level. So if this big gray circle represents corporate strategy, things like legal, tax, and finance, that only falls into the corporate. If we go to marketing strategy, here's our definition. We just decided. That's getting right down to the customer's mind, being customer-centric. And obviously, the sales and marketing organization is very much focused on marketing strategy. But there are other groups, HR, operations, and R&D, for example, that actually work for both. Our HR is both a part of corporate strategy, but it also is important for marketing strategy. Let's think about that. Let's think of a company like Starbucks. Starbucks sells coffee. They have a policy where they hire, if you will, very good people. They give them health care. They give them a retirement plan. They give them um, resources to go to college or to get advanced education. How does that help their marketing strategy? Well, when they treat their people like this, guess what? They can hire stronger people into the job because they're giving more benefits. They can also make them more loyal and more committed and build a better culture in the firm. Do you think that matters when you go in and work at a Starbucks and you go in as a customer and deal with one of these, these employees? Of course it does. They treat you very different. This is one of the reasons Starbucks doesn't use franchises. They want to have all their stores owned by themselves, so their own employees, so they know that the culture that they build at their people matter. So you can see HR, while it is a part of corporate strategy, also can impact marketing strategy. If you think of Walmart's operations and their supply chain, so they can deliver low-cost product very quickly and efficiently, that impacts their differential advantage, which is they can have everyday low prices. R&D, if you think of companies like Apple, Bose, stereos, speakers. Those innovative products they come out, that's part of their image. That's part of their brand message. So these areas where some people don't consider that part of marketing strategy, they absolutely share part of corporate and marketing. And I draw, I purposely draw this circle in marketing strategy fairly big. Why? Because I would argue for most firms, this is what determines this long-term success not how well they fill out their tax returns or how they um, finance their firm or even their legal. Now, these things can cause serious problems at a firms if they're not operating correctly. But I think this is the essence of successful strategy at the corporate level and obviously at the market level. Next, I'd like to motivate a little bit. Why bother focusing on market, marketing strategy? How does it matter? Does it really impact firm performance? And I want to just... Um, show a couple things. First, there's lots of research documenting the importance of customer satisfaction, of brand, and we'll hear about this in many of the sessions we go through. But I'm going to use this chain ratio to describe it. And the way a chain ratio works is this. I'm going to look at a firm's sales, and I'm going to break down sales, and there's an example of 500,000, by market demand, that's how big the market is, times how much share the firm has of that market, so 10% in this case, multiplied by the firm's average selling price. If you multiply those three together, you get the firm's sales. Now we're gonna do the same thing for gross profit. We take firm sales down here, just carry it down. We multiply by the percentage of the firm's gross margin, and we subtract off the cost of sales and marketing expense, and also other firm expenses. This together would be the firm's SG&A. And what I want to look at is what kinds of things in marketing, where does it affect this chain ratio? So let's look at the first thing. If you grow the market, and we'll use an example, we'll stick to Apple. When Apple launched the new iPhone, a new smartphone, did it impact the size of the overall market? Absolutely. It, it increased the orders of magnitude. So it grew the market, which also helped 
Apple, but also helped some of their competitors. It made the market bigger. When they launched a new product, did it help their individual share? Yes, they were able to steal share from the competitors. So when they launched that new product, it made the market bigger, it gave them a larger share. And in that product, if you have better products, it also made better prices and margin because their product allowed them to charge a premium. And so what did that happen? It impacted the firm's selling price and it impacts the firm's margin. So we can look, one marketing initiative, like a new R&D project where you launched a new iPhone, impacted the firm's sales revenue in three ways. It made the market bigger, it gave them a larger share, and it gave them a higher price. So if you want to look at how marketing works, sometimes it's hard to isolate it because it affects it in so many ways. It also affects the firm's profit. First, it increased sales, as we showed up here, but it also increased the firm's gross margin. So it had effects in multiple places. Lastly, it also can reduce cost. It can reduce sales and marketing expense. How much free publicity, free PR, did Apple get when they launched that? Was there lots of newspaper articles, news reports, showing people's line, lines of people standing outside the Apple store? That's all free PR. How many people took their iPhone and showed it to their friend and say, oh look, this is a pretty cool feature? That allowed the firm to grow their customers through word of mouth, built their brand, and that reduced their need to spend money on advertising. So just one new product launch, obviously a very good product launch, impacted sales and profits in many, many different ways. And one of the reasons why it's very hard to isolate what's the impact of a dollar spent on building a better brand or improving a better product is it impacts the firm's performance at many, many different levels. So in addition to the academic research and, and managerial research showing it's important, this kind of gives you a little flavor that it impacts across the firm. Okay, that was kind of a quick overview of marketing strategy. We gave the definition. We talked a little bit about motivating why to even put effort into marketing strategy. What I want to do next is I'm going to go through the four principles of market strategy. And I'm going to give you just a quick overview so you have a framework in your mind as you hear the material over the next um, sessions. And one thing I want to do on a little bit of terminology. You notice up here I call it MP number one. That's for market principle number one. Market principle number one combines two parts. The first part is the first principle. The first principle is the idea that all customers differ. So all customers differ, that's kind of the, the fundamental thing that is just a fact. That leads to us needing to understand how to manage customer heterogeneity. How to manage customer variation. This is the strategy part. When you put these two together, the first principle that they're different, plus the strategies you do to deal with those differences, together those represent a marketing principle. So very often I'll talk about market principle one. When I talk about marketing principle, that's the first principle plus the strategies to deal with it. I'm gonna go through all four of those. So let's get started. First, I wanna motivate why a first principle approach. Managers, I would argue, are being overwhelmed overwhelmed with the complexity of all the different tools and processes and research techniques. How often have we heard about big data? Go study big data. If you go to the bookstore, you'll see new books come out every three months on a new marketing concept, a new framework driven, developed by a consultant. How do we know when to use each of these? When to apply it? We think this framework we're outlining will help. Another thing I often bring up, and this is 10 years ago, I used to be exclusively using cases to teach marketing strategy. I would give an example of a firm and say, look at this business situation, look what this firm did, and see how successful they are. Now I use very few cases. I really use examples, and I use some cases for data. Why did I shift away from cases? Well, the problem with just using cases are multiple. First, it's hard to find a case for every marketing problem. So you're sitting in a conference room two years from now and you have a marketing problem. What if I never used a case to describe that individual marketing problem? You say, geez, I, I don't know what to do in that case. I don't know in, the, in this situation because I didn't see that example. That's a problem. The second problem is, let's say there was a case similar to your business situation and you follow it. Do you think doing the same thing that somebody did five years previously in a situation will work the same way. I would argue it doesn't. It doesn't because of really 
Four different things that might be different. You might have different customers than they did. Guess what? Your customers behave different. You might be in a different stage of the industry or the product or market life cycle. So that might work early in the life cycle, but it doesn't work later. You might be in a different competitive situation. You might have different resources. So these things might be different. And when they're different, just following what the, the firm did in the case might not work. Thus, a key requirement for making good marketing decisions is to identify the underlying factors that the decision depends. And we think these factors, the most important ones, are these four things, and you'll recognize they're really tied each one to one of the first principles. So our argument is this. First principles approach argues that the market strategy is the pursuit of solutions to four fundamental marketing problems and organizes all the frameworks, processes, and analyses to solve these problems. That's really the essence of taking a first principles approach, is we say these four are important. So rather than just give you examples and say, oh, look at how this firm made a lot of money, look at how this firm made a lot of examples, we're going to try to make it so it's very clear on how to understand these four situations and develop a marketing strategy. So here's a little review, very similar to what I just spoke of. Market principle one is all customers different. We want to manage customer heterogeneity. That's the, the techniques we're going to show you and how to deal with that problem. The second one is all customers change. And we're going to deal with you, how do you manage customer dynamics? How do you manage customer dynamics? As customers change over time, what do you do? Firms do a lot to solve that problem. Third, all competitors react. And the way we're going to deal with that is we're going to manage our competitive, our sustainable competitive advantage. And I'll often use an abbreviation for that. I'll call that SCAs. SCA is a sustainable competitive advantage. The idea is, think of a sustainable competitive advantage as building walls around your business. Or maybe a moat and walls. You're trying to protect your business because if you're successful, you know competitors are going to come after you. And you want to have some way to repel them. And we're going to talk more. So you know competitors are going to react. This is how you build your barriers. Fourth. After you do all these, you're going to have to make some decisions, and these decisions take money. But you only have a fixed number of resources. So we want to understand how do you best manage these resource trade-offs. Each one of these is going to be a chapter in the book, and we're going to have a session on it. OK, now that we did a little overview of that, I'm going to go through each principle, just a couple slides on each one to give you that little executive overview. The first one, all customers differ. My premise is to you that for every product and service, customers vary on their desires and needs for that product and service. So let's think of something. In the financial services, there's over 9,000 mutual funds. Do we really need 9,000 ways to group stocks to meet your investment? Well, I guess customers desire different things, so they're able to get away with it. You go to a typical grocery store in the United States, you get 60,000 SKUs. SKUs are shopkeeper units. 60,000 different things. As you push your car up and down the aisle, you look at something as simple as bottled water. Bottled water. How many different types of bottled water is there at a typical US grocery store? And this is fundamentally, it's H2O. It's the same ingredient in every one. Most people would consider that a commodity. But marketing has said, geez, maybe it comes from Canada. Maybe it comes from a mountain in Hawaii. It comes from Colorado. Is it from spring water or is it distilled water? These differences, is it put in a different kind of bottle? Is the bottle tall? Does it have a, a, a resealable lid? Is it a screw top? All these differences allow people to position their water at different groups of customers. And these customers have different desires and needs for bottled water, even though at the fundamental level, it is exactly the same chemical compound, H2O. And obviously, it's been done for coffee, cars. You can name pretty much any product. So I would argue all customers are different. So how do firms deal with that generically? What they do is they try to partition the customers. If, there's, if this whole room, all of you, let's say we're going to look at automobiles. Let's say this part of the room all have three or four kids and you want minivans. This part of the room wants, are all single and are fairly have a pretty good job and you want sports cars. If I was a firm selling automobiles and I average and I gave you all a survey on what your desires for a car were, I averaged them together and I designed one car for the whole market. 
That car would have minivan features and it would have sports car features. How well do you think that car would solve the minivan people? No, I don't think it would work very well. They'd say, geez, why do you have all this engine, all this performance stuff on it? I just want a car to have my four kids in. The sports guy said, geez, I don't want to have sliding doors on the side in this big old lunker. It doesn't look very sporty. So neither group would be solved. If I sold that product, and I had to compete against one firm that only made minivan and another firm that just focused on the sports car, who would win? Guess what? The guy focusing just on minivans would have a better product for that group than I would that had an, a product for everybody. And the same for the sports car. So the way people are dealing with this is they're targeting smaller and smaller groups. Why? Because one of the things we learn, if you target a big group and you average them all together, your product doesn't fit everybody very well. If I cut that group in half and I design a product that's perfectly suited for one part of that with a very homogeneous group, my product will fit their needs better. And that's why there's so many retails, that's why there's so many car brands, that's why there's so many different forms of water. So the way firms are dealing with this idea that all customers are different, they're targeting smaller and smaller segments. And we've even seen this in the evolution of marketing where we moved from mass marketing, where we kind of sold one product let's say a beer, to the whole, um, at a Super Bowl ad, to everyone, to now, then we went to niche marketing, and even today, many firms are moving to one-to-one -to -one marketing. And in many ways, one-to-one -one marketing is most effective. When Amazon makes a recommendation for you for a book, they base that on all the other books you've bought, and they've looked at what other people like that bought those similar books, and makes an individual recommendation to you. In some ways, that's a one-to-one -one marketing. But there's a competitive race. There's a competitive race if firms try to target smaller and smaller segments. Here's a good example we can think of. It's Sears. Sears is a retailer from the US. They used to, it's discontinued now, but they used to sell a catalog, hundreds of thousands of catalogs they would mail all across the US. And families would really be excited when this catalog showed up. This was before the internet. The catalog was about three inches thick and they sold one version of the catalog, or they mailed one version of the catalog to the farmer in Iowa and to the um, single person living in Manhattan. The farmer might turn to page 200 and there'd be two pages of, of, of equipment that they'd be interested in for farming, or maybe even some sports equipment. And then the Manhattan person would turn to a different page. But guess what's happened to them? They ended up going out of business, you know why? Multitude of firms came and designed smaller catalogs. One just for farmers, one for just people in Manhattan, maybe another one for a sports enthusiast. If you would think of it, if you compare it to a company called Eurosport, Eurosport sells, has a catalog selling sporting equipment mainly for soccer. For their, it has the jerseys for all the teams, uh, the EPL and, and many different teams. Sears might have had four pages for soccer or for sports equipment. If you're a soccer enthusiast, do you think you'd like to look at the four pages in Sears or the 30 or 40 pages by Eurosports targeted just at what you're interested in? Guess what? You'd rather go to the Eurosport, so Sears lost that business. And this happened one after another. People came out and targeted niche after niche till finally Sears had a big catalog and they weren't really competitive in hardly any of the, any of the markets. So why is this happening? Why are firms targeting smaller and smaller niches? Why is it very hard to be a mass marketer today? It's hard because customers have inherent desires and those desires vary dramatically. Some of those are real desires. People are thirsty, they have a desire for water. That's a functional need, no problem. But there's also perceived needs. Marketers spend a lot of time increasing these perceived needs. That you need a spring water or you need to have a little lemon sprayed in it. It's gonna be fresher that way. So customers do, their needs do vary, both real needs and in some cases we convince them they have specific needs. The other thing is, if you focus on a narrow segment, you're very much faster to respond to customers' needs and trends when it changes. Let's think about this. If I'm a firm and I sell products to all market segments, and there's some small change going on in the healthcare market. How quick am I going to be able to detect that change? That change is lost in the noise of financial services, government, high tech. 
Let's say there's another firm over here that only focuses on healthcare. Every one of their salespeople, all they call on is day in and day out of healthcare people. So in other words, when this little change goes on in the healthcare, guess what? They see that change very, very quickly. Every one of their customers are talking about that change. So they pick that up and they're able to adapt to that very quick. So when you're focused on a narrow niche, you're faster able to detect change and respond. You better match customers' needs, faster to respond. This is happening more and more today because of technology. Technology has enabled this. You can look either by getting data or and also searching people out on the internet. You can find very small groups of customers and you can offer economically a product to them. Why? Because they can find you very cheaply. When people only used to shop in a retail store, if you're a small little person the only with a business, the only way you could reach all those customers is to get your product put in all those retails. Today, you can put it online and have people come in and target you very small. So technology has enabled that. The only reason everybody isn't doing one-to-one -one marketing, which really is the best way, is because in some markets, it's just not cost prohibitive to do that. For example, can you design and manufacture a car exactly how an individual person wants? No, that's probably too expensive today. But can you do it for clothing? Well, it used to be firms made blue jeans in three sizes, small, medium, and large. And then, as you know, they've expanded out to, you go into a Levi store, it's amazing how many different kinds of jeans they have. But one of the things you're seeing happening, and there's companies doing it today, and it's going to be, I think, five years from now it'll be common, you'll be able to order your jeans custom made to you. You'll be measured with a machine, that data will be fed into a, a piece of equipment that'll be able to make jeans one-off that exactly fit you. Now you say, wow, that's going to be very expensive. Well, it used to be printing. Different catalogs would be very expensive, but if you look at your digital printing, it costs no more to have the second paper come out of your printer than if it's different than the first one or if they're the same. It used to be in the old print technology, if you had to change what came out, it would cost different. That's not the case today, and it won't be the case in the future for clothing. Well, so we can see this technology is allowing one-to-one -one marketing to be successful. So what do we've said? We've said, first principle one is all customers different. How do firms deal with it? They're dealing with it by segmenting smaller and smaller, ultimately to get the one-to-one -one marketing. And these are some of the reasons this is trending in that direction. So that's kind of a very quick overview of the first principle of, and if you will, the first marketing principle, all customers different, and we're going to manage customer heterogeneity. For every one of the market principles, we're going to have a framework. It's a visual representation of what we do. It works by coming from inputs. This is where you manage customer heterogeneity, and this is what your output is. And I think this is a, a fairly intuitive or simple way to think of it. Let's walk through this, and we're going to go through this again when I do the whole chapter just on market principle one. The inputs are what sometimes are called the three C's. It's information about all your potential customers, their needs and their demographics. Things about your company or your SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threat. You need to have that information about your competitors too. You take these three pieces of information about your customers, all potential customers, not existing, your company, your competitor, and you feed it through these approaches and processes and analyses. Segment, targeting, and positioning, we'll go in in a lot more detail. That's the basic process for dealing with the idea of all customers differ. We're going to talk about perceptual and position maps and this idea of customer-centric view, really putting the customer at the center of your decision making. There's a set of analyses that help to deal with this. Factor analysis, cluster G, matrix discriminant, and classification analyses. So what is the output you get? Well, the first output you get is very helpful. So back before when I was talking about the car, let's say this was a whole market for automobiles, after I go through this, one of the things I'm going to get out is I'm going to get a map of the industry. It's going to show me the different segments. It's going to say, here's a group of consumers that want minivans. Here's a group of consumers that want sports cars, sedans, trucks. It's going to give you a map of the market. Is that helpful? Yes, because how can I decide my decisive point of attack? If you remember back to the, the beginning of market strategy, or actually military strategy, 
How can I decide that if I don't know the landscape? That first thing it gives you is a map, a map of your market. The second thing, it's going to give you detailed information so you can detect, you can determine which of these segments you want to go after. Do you want to go after the minivan or you want to go after the sports car? It allows you to aim your market resource to one of these segments, to that decisive point where you think you can have victory, where your firm can beat out the competitors and have a relative advantage. The third thing is after you decide, you have the map, you pick which one you're going to go after, now I have to really de start to develop my strategy. It's how am I going to win? What do I want customers to think about me in my target segment? It's really the who, what, and why of going after your customers. So that would be the framework we're going to use to manage customer heterogeneity in order to deal with the fact that all customers differ. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing for market principle two. Just a quick overview on two on a couple slides. First, customers' desires and needs for most products and services vary over time. We feel that's a fact. Let's stick to our automobile example. Do you think the car you have while you're sitting in the, as, a, as a senior in high school or maybe a freshman at college, do you think the needs of your car there are going to vary versus the car that you need when you take your first job? Or maybe after you get married and have children? Or maybe after you retire? As your life goes on, for all the different products you buy, your needs and desires change. Some of those are functional needs, some of them are other. So consumer needs change. Sometimes there's trigger events that make these changes occur. Just think of all the things that happen when you have a child. Do you think your financial services needs change? Your automobile needs change? Even your entertainment? An interesting fact is people buy more beer after they have children. Why? They can no longer go out to the bar, so they buy it and bring it home. Industries and market changes. If you look at the personal computer industry, that has changed dramatically over the last 20 or 30 years. So customers' needs, if we summarize, vary not only due to the inherent differences in people, that's market principle one, the idea that all customers differ and we have to manage heterogeneity, but they also change because people and markets change over time. So this is a tough problem. If you're trying to deliver a product or service that exactly meets your customer's needs, first, all customers differ, and guess what? They're all moving. And so you have to track them as they move in order to satisfy them over time. Thus, our segment and targeting that we talked about under market principle one has to vary for the idea that customers' life cycles change and there's customers' dynamics. So let's go through the framework for this. We have three inputs for this also, for market principle two. First, you have to have information on your individual customers. How does your individual customer sales margin the cost? This gives you financial. And also, how do their behaviors and their needs and wants change over time? So now we focus more into our own customer base and we want to understand how those customers are changing over time. You have to look at your past marketing programs, where you found your new customers, your acquisition, how you retained your new customer. How did those different programs work? We're also going to study our lost customers. Lost customers have a lot of good information in it. When a customer has been buying from you, and they all of a sudden leave and start buying from somebody else, they made a conscious decision. They had to take some effort to do that. I think an interesting example of this, and I'll bring this up later, is Honda. Honda was surprised at one point where they found they had customers that gave them a 10 out of 10 on a satisfaction scale. These people bought two or three Hondas in a row and they thought they were very loyal customers. They were surely satisfied customers. And all of a sudden they found these customers no longer buying a Honda. And they said, why? They went and investigated these lost customers and they found the problem was these people had advanced in life They've got promotions, they're earning more money, and they want to have a higher status car than a Honda. It was actually the reason Honda came out with Acura. So that these customers that were migrating out of owning a Honda could move into their next brand, and their next higher-end brand was an Acura. 
A lot of good information. That's not always the good news on lost customers. Sometimes it's because you have product or service failure. And in those cases, you might need to fix the problem also. So what are the approaches and analyses we use for this? We use a life cycle. We do dynamic segmentation. And we use this thing we call acquisition, expansion, and retention model. You're going to see us talk about that a bit. It's going to be the AIR model, AIR, A-E-R. Come to find out, when you first acquire a customer, they're a little different than after they've been in your portfolio for five years, and we're going to understand that we need to treat those customers different. Lost customer I already spoke of. Some of the analyses we do here, lifetime value, CLV, hidden Markov model, choice models, and we also look at factor, cluster, discriminant, and classification analysis, just like we do at Market Principle 1. These, a lot of these techniques can be used in more than one market principle. Some of them are best suited for one of them, and we'll go through that as time goes on. So what do we get out of this framework? If we know how to manage customer dynamics, we get three outcomes. Segmentation of customers, and this is the outcomes of, if you will, air. First, market principle one segments the whole market. Let's say we decided to go after the sports car. Market principle two now focuses on the sports car and we understand their dynamics as they go through the life. When they first buy, let's we'll pick on a BMW. They first buy a BMW, what do they want? Maybe it's a three series. And then over a number of years, they get a little bigger. Maybe they go to a five series. At some point, geez, maybe the, the kids leave the family and they want to go to a two seater. Whatever, maybe a convertible. So we segment, the first outcome is segmenting our own customer base and understanding how they migrate through our life cycle. Once we understand that, why they migrate, maybe they migrate with kids, maybe they migrate with retirement, then we go through air positioning. Air positioning statements are very similar to the overall positioning statements we have for the firm for the overall market, but they actually look at what we want customers to think about us when they first start buying from us. Let's think of financial services. As a college, if when you're in the junior and senior year of college, you're gonna get bombarded with applications for credit cards. 15 to 20 a year. Why are banks coming after you? Because they know you're gonna graduate and start making money, and they know if you can first get a credit card, then after a couple years, maybe they can give you a home loan, maybe a checking account, savings account, maybe retirement planning, life insurance, whatever the case may be. These positioning states, they have positioning statements, is what that financial services company wants to have you think about them when you first graduate. That positioning statement, that might be their acquisition positioning statement. Their expansion might be four years later and what they want you to think about when you're adding more mortgages, when you're trying to expand services. And then for each of these segments within the, your own customer portfolio, you want to look at the strategies that will best work for them. So we have air positioning, acquisition, expansion, retention positioning. We have air strategies, acquisition, expansion, retention strategies. So that ends the second principle. First one's all customers differ, we manage customer heterogeneity. Second one, all customers change, we manage customer dynamics. Now the third one, let's say we do both of those things very well. First we segment the whole market, we go after sports car, then we understand our sports car customers and how they migrate through their life cycle, and we're making lots of money dealing with the sports car. We know competitors are going to come after us. So next we're going to talk about what can we do. Competitors are always copying successful strategies and trying to innovate new strategies. That strategy could actually be a new business process or actually a new market, an actual new product. And you'd say, well, once a firm gets big, it stays successful. Well, it's very interesting to understand only one firm in the original Dow is still there, General Electric. All the other firms were the leaders in their industry. Think of Kodak, Eastman Kodak, Polaroid, film industries. Do you think, how did those firms did? They both went bankrupt, dropped from the Dow. So things change, and no matter how strong your position, competitors are going to come after you. Typically, given enough time and money, your strategy can be copied. Thus, we need to build this barrier I have spoke of earlier. This barrier are the walls around our business. The walls and barriers around our business. We term that wall sustainable competitive advantage. And it needs three things. 
To have a sustainable competitive advantage, for something in your firm to be called a sustainable competitive advantage, it has to meet three conditions. First, customers have to care. Customers have to care. That's a customer-centric view, right? They have to care. We know their needs and desires, and they have to want it. Second, if you're going to compete on this fact, you have to do it better. Be it brand, be it performance, be it low cost, you need to do it better than competitors. And the third, it has to be hard to duplicate. Because if customers care, you do it better, but everybody can copy you, you're not going to be able to be sustainable. So it has to meet those three conditions. Sources of competitive advantage. There's really three categories of sources we're going to look at. First, building brands and relationships. If you look at Coca-Cola, the soft drink, what do you think the biggest barrier of that firm being taken to being knocked out of business? Do you think it's their recipe of making their soft drink taste better? Well, no. In a blind taste test, actually Pepsi beats Coke. If you look at the new Coke that was a, a brand failure, they actually designed that because it was a more successful taste in a blind taste test. But the real barrier to the business isn't their recipe. It would only take a couple million dollars for somebody to make a soft drink that would have a better blind taste test. Their barrier to the business is their brands. That brand people have seen from their whole life, from when they were young children. It resides in their mind. Another way you can build um, barriers is relationships. In some cases, you might have such a good relationship with somebody who provides you services, you would never think, maybe your person who cuts your hair, your hairdresser. Very often people have been known after they moved to fly back to their old town to use their old hairdresser. Do they really believe there's no one in their own town, that, in their new town, that can't make, cut their hair well enough? No, it's that relationship bond. People have been known to walk by one Starbuck to go to another Starbuck to get the exact same drink only because they can get a head nod from the, the barista. Why? Because the person recognizes them. They have a relationship. Relationships are very powerful. We'll talk about how relationships can be a big barrier. You can also offer innovative offerings. New products and services. Sometimes you can patent those like in pharmaceuticals. In other cases, you might have trade secrets. Low cost, location, you can be the first. There's lots of ways you can build barriers in Innovative. So if you look at, there's really three main ways we build barriers. Brands, offerings, and relationships. Those three together, we call BOR strategies. B-O-R, brands, offering, and relationships. We use the term offering rather than products to capture both products and services because most offerings are both products and services. And we're going to show how these are how we build barriers around our business. You might say, of these three, which ones are building growing importance? We'll talk more about this. But brands and relationships, and especially relationships, are coming back to the forefront as a way to build barriers. The reason is, innovation, while important in many industries, is one of the easiest things to copy. There's only a few industries can you patent it and really have the patents stand up to prevent people from working around your patents. And pharmaceutical is a good example of that. So what's the framework for market principle three? If you look at the inputs in this case are the outputs of the first two principles, market principle one and two. Positioning statements for market principle one, air strategies from, <coughs> excuse me, for market principle two. And we also need to look at future trends. This goes through the same framework of approaches, processes, and analyses for managing sustainable competitive advantage. We're going to look at things like the equity stack, air strategy and bore equity grids, brand and relationship management, innovation process. We're also going to look at a number of analyses, <clears throat> field experiments, conjoint, multivariate, choice models. What do we get as outputs? We get how we're going to win today and in the future. We're going to understand what is our sustainable competitive advantage now and in the future because firms have to change. GE would have not stayed as being the only firm to remain in the Dow if they still only made light bulbs and switch equipment. They shifted. They shifted to services. They shifted a lot to financial services, funding thing. Um, now they're moving more to knowledge in the digital economy. They fouled what happened based on future trends.
Very infrequently can you have the same sustainable competitive advantage forever. The other thing we're going to get out is we're going to get our bore strategies. And this is where we're really going to spend a lot of money and time. If you're a firm building brands, innovating new offerings, and building relationships with your sales organization, your inside sales and customer service team, that's where you spend a lot of money. And it's where we spend a lot of effort in marketing. We're going to actually spend one whole chapter on each of these. Because these are, for marketing, this is actually a big part of how we are successful in building sustainable competitive advantage. Now we're going to look at the fourth and last market principle, which is the idea that all resources are limited. So if you look at it, most marketing decisions require trade-offs across multiple objectives. Let's think of some of these objectives. It could be you have a certain budget, you could spend it on advertising, salespeople, discounts to customers, R&D, channel co-ops, many, many examples. So how do you decide where to spend your money? In some cases, it's not just a mo money trade-off, it's a message trade-off. Do you think as one firm, you can be seen as a high status brand and the low cost provider? Let's think of Tiffany jewelry, very expensive. Can they also, and they have a high status brand, could they all of a sudden launch some products that are at the low end? Don't you think that would hurt their high end brand? So very, hard, very often it's hard to do two messages. You have to decide your target market and have one message for them. And there's short term versus long term trade offs. Very often if the quarter isn't going well financially, firms will cut back on their advertising spend so that money can be shown as profit. Cut back on cost. Thus, you need to balance market resources across these. You need to cross different customer segments, across acquisition, expansion, retention. How much budget do you want to spend on bringing in new customers versus retaining old ones? Across brands offering relationships, are you going to spend more money on advertising or more money on your sales force? And across all the different market mix elements. So what does the grid look like here? The framework. These are the inputs from all three for market principle one, two, and three. Positioning, air strategies, and bore strategies. It comes in, we're gonna go through both the heuristic and the attributional approach for making resource decision trade-offs. And we're gonna have some analyses, be it response model, experiments, and anchor and adjustment. And we'll go through those in detail. What do you get out? You get out both the metrics you're gonna to use to measure success across all your market principles, as well as what you need. This is where you get into the action items, your budget and your plan. How big is the budget? How do you allocate it? And across what time horizon? So we do all that work to ultimately come up with a marketing plan and a marketing budget. So that's a summary of the first principles of marketing strategy. We break it down into four. So really all the rest of the material is going to go through these in detail. And especially we're going to spend a lot of time, as I mentioned, on how to build sustainable competitive advantage through brands offering and relationships. Now the question might be, well, how do these four fit together? Do you do them all separately or is there some natural sequence? Well, there is a natural sequence. Here's the picture. And I'm going to walk through this a little bit. You do market principle one. That drives a positioning statement. That positioning statement's used for understanding how you're going to build walls around your business because your positioning statement tells you who your customers are and how you're competing. So that tells you how to build your walls. It also gives you input into your resource trade-offs. Market principle two on customer dynamics gives you positioning and strategy statements around acquisition, expansion, and retention. This one's for the whole market. This one's for your existing customers only. They also feed into how you're going to build sustainable competitive advantage and how you make resource trade-offs. Out of your sustainable competitive advantage or how all competitors react box, you come out with your bore strategies. How are you going to use brands offering relationships to build barriers around your business? All three principles feed into managing resource trade-offs. What comes out of this? Your plans, and that's your SCA. So you can see there is a natural sequence to these. It's also interesting to note, if I was teaching this or I was going through this textbook, let's say 10 years ago, I would only focus on these two. You do your STP, dealing with all customers different, and you drive right down into your market mix trade-offs and do your plan. Where marketing has really advanced in the last decade or so is we've added in this idea of managing dynamics and we've added in this idea of 
let's really understand how to build barriers around our business or SCA. The last thing I'd speak to, and this is really only interesting to you if you're also using this book in conjunction with Markstrat. Again, that's very much optional. But if you are, Markstrat does allow you to experiment and actually in your classroom and among each other, you can um, practice the first principle. So let's go through how Markstrat does the first principle. The first thing it does, it allows you to target to meet needs of different customer segments and manage heterogeneity. So they have multiple different markets. Let's look at, if you're familiar with this, with the Sonite market, they have high earners and savers and it allows you to target those with different products. Second, it allows you to deal with customers' needs because each week as you're competing, customers are changing. They might be moving in different directions. Some segments get bigger, some might become more price sensitive. The third, it allows you to build SEA. You can launch new products. You can advertise certain characteristics about your product to build a brand around your product. And then lastly, it allows you and it makes you make resource trade-offs between advertising, R&D, sales, and you have to do that across multiple products. So it's kind of interesting and I like this simulation because it allows you to practice and actually do the first principles. Well, this really concludes the first session where we looked at kind of an overview of marketing strategy based on the first principles in data analytics. And we did it across all customers differ, customers change, all competitors react, all resources are limited. And that's going to be the organizing framework for all this material. Thank you.